So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope this has been a very fun, vet-filled weekend for you guys. Uh, my name is Justin Lam. I'm the current director of pre-vet programming for the Pre-Health Student Alliance, and I'll be moderating this panel today. And this is the specializations in the vet field panel. So over the six, past six months, we've been collecting questions from online viewers and on our online forums. And we'll be addressing those questions first. And if we have questions, uh, if we have time uh, later at the end of the panel, we can address those questions from the audience as well. So if I could have each of the distinguished panelists introduce themselves, stating their name, their institution that they went to for vet school, and also their specializations track. Uh, starting with Dr. Payan. Good to meet you. And I think I've seen some of you in prior lectures. Um, I just want to say I think Justin's done a great job of organizing this. We've been working hard with him. And um, I also want to start by saying, just as a general comment, it's interesting to see how much popularity there is in specialization in veterinary medicine among pre-vets. My personal opinion, it's a little bit early for you to be thinking about it. Um, and I'd be curious as we go through to learn why there's so much interest. Is it financially based? Is it based on your undergraduate education? Um, but anyway, I think in my, the point being, I think figuring out what it is to get through vet school and then what it means and what it's like to be a veterinarian in general. And even if you specialize, I think it's really important to always kind of keep a general view and look at the animal as a whole animal rather than just the single organ that you're, 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 you're focused on, which I think we all agree sometimes frustrating when we go to physicians. But anyway, go back to what I'm supposed to say. Paul Payan, I'm an 83 graduate from a good veterinary school, Cornell, and uh, I went from there to the Animal Medical Center, did my internship, then I did a postdoc in pharmacology at Columbia Med School, and then I came out to Davis to do my residency in cardiology where I was very fortunate in doing some research with Genentech and then um, with others around the world, found the cause and the cure for what was then the largest, uh, most popular, most prevalent heart disease in cats, dilated cardiomyopathy. And it ended up being a deficiency of one amino acid, taurine, in their food from commercial food manufacturers. So we rewrote the formulation of all the cat foods and that disease has pretty much from that been eliminated. There's other cats that present with it from other causes still, but very few. And from there, I went on to five years of research and doing spavatic replacements in the clinic here and lecturing and have gone on from there to a specialty practice, a mobile cardiology practice, house call practice. And now I run uh, Veterinary Information Network, which is a large online community and, and database and continuing education service for veterinarians. And it's good to be here with you. Hi, I'm Becky Sakai. And I took a pretty direct route from um, undergraduate in, right into private practice. So after college, I went to veterinary school at Kansas State. And I graduated from there in 2007. I spent one year in New Jersey doing an internship in small animal medicine and surgery. And then I went back to the Midwest for another three years to do my residency in veterinary dermatology at Iowa State. And from there, I was very homesick. So I came back to California and went into private practice at a dermatology-only small animal private practice uh, in the Bay Area. And then recently, about a year ago, moved my uh, practice out here to Rockland, so just kind of north of Sacramento. And I'm in private practice there with one other dermatologist, and I love it. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my career path is probably a little bit different than uh, the other panelists here. I'm originally from Brazil, um, and uh, that's where I went to vet school. In Brazil, the uh, education system is slightly different. We can actually go to vet school straight out of high school. And so that's what I did. So I don't have much of an idea of the, uh, the formal college education that you guys have. I mean, I've been in the US for a little while now, so I, I know of it, but I didn't go through it. Uh, I graduated in 1999 uh, from vet school in Santa Maria in the south of uh, Brazil. And uh, in 2001, I moved to the frozen tundra of Minnesota, uh, <laughs> where I did uh, a residency in veterinary anesthesiology. 
combined with a PhD program. I finished those in 2005, the uh, residency, and I became uh, board certified in veterinary anesthesiology. Um, I was the first Brazilian and South American to um, get board certification, so I was pretty proud of myself uh, at that point. And then in 2006, I finished my PhD, and after that, I uh, started a um, faculty position at Texas A&M uh, University in Texas. So it was a, a little bit uh, better there in terms of weather, a little warmer, uh, more like uh, Brazil. But then it became too warm and too humid in Texas, and I thought I would uh, go try find some uh, uh, warm weather, but not as humid. And so I moved to California in 2010 uh, as a faculty as well. And so I've been here for four years. Uh, it's been wonderful. Uh, I am a veterinary anesthesiologist. Uh, we we uh, help uh, our colleagues with their uh, as they're caring for their patients. We take care of the anesthesia. Uh, part of it, so we make sure that the um, patient is asleep, but that our organ functions, as far as we can measure and assess them, are maintaining within normal limits, and that at the end of this, the animal um, can return to its normal life or uh, hopefully even a better life. So we really have a huge responsibility on our hands uh, to take care for these patients that are unconscious, they're anesthetized, and, and the patients, they uh, vary from uh, as little as a, as a mouse to as big as an elephant, and so we don't necessarily specialize in a, one species or another, even though there are some of my colleagues that have done so, but it, typically a veterinary anesthesiologist will be working with our species, and so might they, you know, uh, routinely we anesthetize cats, dogs, horses, cows, sheep, uh, sheep uh, goats. Uh, so all those animals. And I really enjoy the variety of animals that I get involved with. Um, I enjoy working with all the different specialties uh, since I work with, you know, cardiologists. I work with dermatologists, surgeons, internists, you know, all of these people. So in a way, I think I was having a hard time deciding what I wanted to be. And so I was like, well, if I become an anesthesiologist, I actually will be close to everybody. So uh, that was my uh, sort of like escape route. So I'm really happy to be here, and hopefully we'll have a, a fun time together talking about uh, different aspects of our, our professions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Could we all give a round of applause to the panel? <laughs> okay, so this first question is directed at Dr. Pine. The question is, what is the most rewarding aspect of your field, and why? Well, for me, uh, there's a couple of points to it. So I got interested in cardiology because of my uh, interest in cardiac physiology. And so to me, cardiology made sense. It's a bunch of plumbing, a bunch of pumps, a couple of pumps, and they feed, um, you know, the capillary systems. And so most of what you see, it's a real detective story, and by doing good history, physical exam, and then confirming that with other tests, um, like ultrasound of the heart and catheterizations or different pressure studies. You can confirm your diagnosis and um, really be able to give the owners an idea of what's going on. When I started, um, it was somewhat frustrating, and it is somewhat still frustrating because you see a lot of diseases that you can't change. And um, that's where in human medicine, they actually can do a lot more because they do a lot more cardiovascular surgery. And I think we're about to see the days when we can do more for animals. And in fact, there's um, a, a researcher and a clinician in Japan who's really made great advances in our ability to do surgery, open heart in dogs. Uh, with mitral valve disease, which is the most common disease that we see acquired in dogs. And we're learning a lot more about the genetics of diseases in dogs and cats, and hopefully that'll lead to, to more. So to me, the, the real satisfaction is being an understand. It's not like medicine where it's pixie dust, you know, and you, know, you just sort of throw stuff at it and you don't know what's wrong with it. Uh, but we can actually see it and, and, and know what we'll be able to do about it. So my favorite thing about dermatology is pretty simple. Um, 
I think one of the biggest ways that people interact with their pets is by just touching them and cuddling with them. And when you have a really stinky dog or a cat, or one that doesn't have nice soft fur anymore, or that's covered with scabs, it kind of messes up that bond that you have with your pet. And so I like being able to sort of try to help fix that so that people can snuggle up with their pets. They don't have something stinky running through their bed or their house. And they don't tend to die. <laughs> That's true. My patients don't usually die from skin disease. <laughs> uh, that's Dr. wonderful. Um, just to add a little bit here, um, probably the most rewarding uh, thing of my profession is really to um, see the patient uh, be relieved of his uh, you know, sufferings or, or problems during a, sometimes a relatively short period of time. And then um, seeing these patients m many times uh, come out of it 100% you know, better from when it started. So, I really enjoy that aspect of my profession that really, you know, you give something, you see something happening and a few hours later, you're, you see sort of like the results of your, of your hard work. Um, I always joke with my internal medicine um, colleagues that, you know, they go months and months sometimes to waiting for a little change and not much happens and, and anesthesia is like boom, boom, you know, you see it happening right there. So to me, that's really rewarding. That's why I'm with it. Great. Thank you. So this next question is directed at Dr. Sakai. And the question is, what is one thing you had considered when pursuing your specialization track, like choosing your specialization? So there's probably two big reasons that I went into dermatology. One is, well, it was kind of a lifestyle choice. So as a veterinary dermatologist, I only work four days a week, and that's pretty standard in my specialty. I also have a really good work-life balance. I have no emergency call. I don't have to come in in the middle of the night. I never work weekends. So it, it was a, a lifestyle choice for those reasons. Medically, I also got interested in dermatology because most dermatologic diseases are chronic. They're not curable, and it's something that um, the pet and the pet owner is going to have to pretty much deal with for the rest of the animal's life. And I liked the idea of being able to help these animals live with a disease that they're going to have pretty much forever. And also to be able to work with their human family members to kind of teach them what's going on with their animal and how they can work with me to help their pet live comfortably with this chronic disease. Um, do any of the other panelists have anything to add to that? Well, one general point I hope you're getting out of this is, and just in veterinary medicine in general, is that it's really a people profession. A lot of people say they want to go into veterinary medicine because they don't like people. And if you don't like people, this is, other than maybe being an anesthesiologist or a radiologist, <laughs> but then you still have to work with the people around you. Yeah, there's no way you can get rid of them. <laughs> but yeah. but it, to me, it's really about the bond with the owner has with the patient that, that provides, you know, I wouldn't say just the value to that life, and we all love the little dogs and cats and horses that we deal with and care about them as individuals, but to me, my commitment to it is very much dictated by the, the owner's commitment and their bond with their animal. I see, you know, I see, uh, we joke about people, but I really see uh, the veterinary anesthesiologist an extension of the, the hands of that owner that dropped off the patient at the hospital and this patient is going to be anesthetized, going to be unconscious, helpless. And it's the job of the veterinary anesthesiologist to really look after that life as good or if not better than the owner would and, and then bring that animal back to the owner at the end of, you know, the end of the, uh, the stay in the hospital. So I, I really see, you know, it is a people's profession. In, in that case, they're just taking the, uh, you know, the responsibility for that pet for, during that, for that time. And I think that's a, it's a huge part of it, really. You know, just uh, um, being responsible and um, following, you know, the uh, the care that the owner would probably be providing for that for that patient or for that for that animal. Great, thank you. So this next question is directed at uh, Dr. Guedes, and the question is, what are some challenges you face during your field in your field of specialty? 
Uh, that's, that's a good question. Where are some of the challenges? In, uh, when Dr. Sakai was mentioning about the, the lifestyle and the, uh, the work-life balance, uh, I was thinking with myself that that's actually one of the, uh, the, the, probably the biggest challenges that I have in my profession is sort of like this uh, balance between work and life. Um, I'm, I'm married and I have two young children. There is one more on the way. And I work pretty much seven days a week, and I do on call and emergencies and all that. And so it, it really becomes a huge challenge for me at times to be able to give my family the attention that they need and uh, be present in my children's uh, life as they're growing up, and, and uh, my wife as well, and helping her out. And so uh, that's been um, probably the biggest challenge. Um, otherwise, uh, the profession itself. It's really rewarding uh, to me, and I think that's what makes me uh, go through it and, and be able to find the energy and motivation to keep going because it's sort of like a, a bank account, right? You, you're, you're drawing one end, but as long as you are putting enough money in, you know, it, it, even though there is a lot, of, uh, you're drawing a lot, you still have money in, in the bank account. So that's what I try to, uh, to, to do in order to maintain that balance there, that I really have a lot of fun in my profession. And I work hard, but you know, I, I keep going with enough energy to pay attention to my family as well. Great, thank you. Uh, do any of the other panelists want to add? Well, I think it breaks down to two categories, personal and professional challenges. And I think we all share the same personal challenges in being uh, some of us workaholics and uh, and to me, the solution to that is I say I'm always working and always playing. And so I really try to not create that division as much so that, you know, both seem to work out. And my family's gotten used to that. Um, and, and so far that works. From a professional side, I think that as specialists in general have a few challenges today. And that is, um, trying to find the line of what's reasonable and that we're not here to make decisions financially for the clients, but there's a lot we can do and we have to ask the question, should we do it? You know, in human medicine we spend, I don't know what the statistic is, but a huge percentage of our health dollars in the last months and weeks of life. And we could question whether those are well spent. Obviously we probably shouldn't spend them unless it's my mother or my grandmother. And then, you know, of course we should make them feel better and, and keep them alive longer. That, that was supposed to be a joke, you know. Um, but that's kind of what it comes down to is, is that it's hard for us to make that, that personal decision. And, and I think there's a, a great struggle today as veterinary medicine adopts and uses a lot of the technologies developed for veterinary medicine and from human medicine and adopted as to, you know, where is the limit on costs and are we pricing ourselves out of the range of most pet owners and setting the standard of care at a level that makes what general practitioners would feel is kind of putting them down. And at the same time, I think as we get more specialists that there is the choice, that this, this kind of this battle of how do we support them? And so you're always trying to make, you know, find that line between marketing and medicine and what's really necessary. Um, and you have to make that decision with the client and you have to make your own peace with yourself morally as to how far to go um, and whether you're doing it for the animal, for the owner, or as lots of reports of, you know, you look at human surgeons and they can show statistically that when their kids are in college, they do a lot more elective procedures and that's at a financial need. Um, and we could argue whether they're needed or not. And I think those are all the kinds of, we go on for hours talking about these kind of issues. But I think they're the kind of issues to keep in mind, and I worry in our profession of kind of a civil war developing between specialists and general practitioners, whereas it really ought to be a collaboration. And I even see in some areas where specialists are getting overcrowded, the specialists are starting to overcompete a little bit there too. So kind of going along with what Dr. Payan's talking about, I think in veterinary dermatology, one challenge that we definitely face is awareness of our specialty because if you went out on the street and you talked to like 50 people, asked them if they knew that there was such a thing as a veterinary dermatologist, I mean, maybe half would know. I'd probably be surprised if half knew that there was such a thing as a veterinary dermatologist. 
And so since um, I've been in practice, it's been something that I've really tried to kind of get the word out there um, and to also convince uh, primary care veterinarians that it's worth referring patients to see veterinary dermatologists because the skin, you know, it's not life-threatening. Sometimes people poo-poo uh, referring to a veterinary dermatologist a little bit. And so, you know, doing things like this and going and speaking at local veterinary med medical associations is something that I think is really important and I've tried to be involved in as much as I can. Great, thank you. So this next question is directed at Dr. Pine. So what are some common misconceptions of your field and I guess anything regarding your specialty? Do you mean by the public or within the field? Uh, you can address either one, but... Okay. Oh, well, by the public, the same issues for dermatology, you know. Sometimes I tell somebody I'm a veterinary cardiologist, and they'll say, dogs have hearts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we can go to that extreme, and people will poo-poo, you know, if I say we put pacemakers in dogs, you know, why would somebody spend that much money? But, you know... And again, it goes back to that relationship. I mean, one case that stands out for me, I can remember a 16-year-old Airedale, sweetest dog, that had bone cancer in its leg, which means the type of cancer it has classically not going to live more than six months. And I put a pacemaker in that dog. And that owner was so happy because it was like a puppy again for the last six months of its life. You know? But those are the kind of decisions that are individual. And, and so I think, again, yeah, it's people knowing you can provide the service, appreciating the service, and yet keeping in perspective how far is reasonable to go. Because unlike dermatology patients, my patients die a lot. And, and it's coming to peace with that, realizing that you know, you, there's a limit to what you can do. So I think the biggest misconception about veterinary dermatology is what exactly do we do? So we're not just uh, treating dogs with pimples. <laughs> um, so you know what we actually do, the, the vast majority of the cases that I treat are allergic animals. So in dogs and cats, unlike in us, um, their allergies manifest on the skin or in the ears. So as veterinary dermatologists, we're kind of skin doctors, but we're also ear doctors. And probably, you know, from week to week, 85% of the cases that I see are dogs and cats with skin and ear problems. Um, also, I do end up seeing autoimmune diseases in dogs and cats. Um, I see hormonal skin diseases. Occasionally, I see skin cancer or drug reactions. So veterinary dermatology is a lot more than just dogs and cats with acne. That's great. Um, probably uh, one of the sort of like the biggest misconceptions that we see in veterinary anesthesiology is really probably relates to the lack of awareness. Uh, for one, that for many people, that this specialty exists, and then, and from then, uh, there is uh, a lot of things that we see, especially with the internet now, with. Uh, especially with uh, dog owners from a, or cat owners or whatever owners from a specific breed of animals that they think, oh, my animal is very sensitive to anesthesia. And they go on and on, uh, sometimes writing letters to the, uh, uh, the people that buy pets from them and, and, and that kind of thing. So they I think they have like a misconception about this specialty and then they go on to perhaps perpetuate that when Really, if, uh, if they, they take the time to consult a veterinary anesthesiologist or, or maybe even a, a knowledgeable uh, veterinarian, that those things would not uh, be there necessarily. And so we, we struggle a little bit sometimes with the, sort of like the, uh, the spread of this misinformation about uh, specific and sort of like weird sensitivities about uh, anesthesia. And really, if they just take the time to consult with uh, the people in the field, uh, that would not be there. And, and probably these new pet owners. Uh, would not be so perhaps concerned about uh, the health care of their pets, you know, because I, I can see how, you know, seeing some of these letters, I can see how some of those pet owners would probably be very reluctant to bring their pets to a veterinarian after, uh, you know, reading that, because some of them, it's really scary. So. I'll add a little more for cardiology and a little more for anesthesia. And anesthesia people just got another letter in their name, two A's. It's anesthesia and analgesia now. 
And to me, that's a big part now of an anesthesiologist's life and a recognition, and I think people don't understand, is, is that there's much more available now and much more attention on pain management, chronic and post-surgical. And that's a great advance for the profession. Um, and there's still a lot of people who think they don't feel pain, and even within the profession, and that's become a major area for, for adding to the comfort. And, and, and the service we can provide. And on the cardiology side, it's that dogs and cats don't really get heart attacks like we have. So um, I had one last year, so now I know what it's like. But, um, and my cardiologist hates it he, because he doesn't want me overlooking and reading over everything he does. But he, get, he makes a lot of mistakes, so I, I end up watching closely. <laughs> um, in fact, he did a cath on me in April, and usually they don't knock you out. And I woke up, and they're cleaning up the lab. I'm like, oh, you bastard, you knocked me out. So I wouldn't <laughs> be able to read the screen while you were doing it. Um, but I was right in the end. He told me he'd have to put another stent in. I said, no, you won't. But anyway, but uh, so dogs and cats don't get, it's very uncommon for them to get coronary artery disease. And I think a lot of people think that dogs will die from a heart attack and cats from a heart attack. And it can happen like it happens in us, but it's very rare. All right, great, thank you. So uh, this next question is open for any panelists. And um, so the question is, what advice would you give to students who are looking to specialize in the field? And how would you kind of approach the specialization, like picking one? Uh, I'd say just follow your your heart. If you feel like you know something sounds interesting, looks interesting, go for it. You'll be you'll be fun. You might you might realize that it's even more fun than than you thought, and then you'll be really in love with it. Or you might realize that really it was not you know what you thought, and that's fine as well. But I think. Uh, the most important thing with anything in, in life, really, is that if you have the, some curiosity, you know, go explore. It's the only way to find out. So I, I would advise you guys to keep an open mind about what you want to do. Because I'll just tell you, when I started vet school, I wanted to be a cow veterinarian. And I ended up pretty much the farthest away from that that you could possibly get. Um, so, you know, before... I decided that I wanted to go into dermatology. I went through different phases where I wanted to be an oncologist, I wanted to be an internist. One thing I never wanted to be was a surgeon because I hate blood, but um, anyway, I didn't, I didn't really end up deciding that I wanted to do dermatology until about six months before the application to residencies were due. And I think a lot of times you end up deciding to go into a certain specialty because you meet someone that really inspires you, and that's what happened to me. So keep an open mind as you go through your education and training. I think that's great advice. I knew I never wanted to be a dermatologist. <laughs> but I mean, I would even start with the decision of whether you want to specialize. Um, and you know, I have classmates and friends who come to me often and say, oh, look what you've done. And I turn around and look at them and say, I'm not, you know, I was lucky. I got to focus on a very small area. And then you can go deep, but narrow. And I look at general practitioners and how many things they need to know and they do every day. Um, and it, to me, that's really impressive and fun and varied. And um, you know, I already said that, I mean, I was very similar in that I went towards cardiology a little bit from background. I started out to be a bovine vet, dairy vet as well, um, and quickly realized that was a little more husbandry and less medicine than I was interested in. So I think it was the physiology of cardiology, and it was a couple of people that really impressed me as mentors that drew me into it. It helped, too, unfortunately, that one of them that really impressed me died when he was a, I was in second year vet school, and so I ended up actually becoming kind of the de facto cardiologist in the clinic at Cornell for the, when I was a junior and senior year to helping out a bit with a couple of residents. Um, so that sort of drives you in a direction. But, you know, I would even say that over time, um, I don't think I ever admitted this before, I'm not in practice anymore, and I drifted away because I actually found it too narrow, and that I got a little bored seeing the same things over and over again and doing the same things over and over again. And um, I look forward to going back into practice, but um, 
I think that you know, at a, I reached a point where I was kind of frustrated by the limited amounts we could do, and, and that's why I stepped away from clinical practice. Great, thank you. Um, so this next question is directed at uh, Dr. Guedes. Um, what advice would you give to students who are looking for um, like vet experience? Like how would one approach a, vet, a veterinarian um, in terms of asking for an internship or just shadowing or any experience? Right, um, so <clears throat> veterinarians in, in general, at least that's been my experience, are um, pretty uh, humble um, folks and they really, um, they're really open to you know, anybody that's interested in, in learning. And I think if you have you know, by your house or your, in your city somebody, you know, a veterinarian, I think uh, you know, it might be a, a good thing to do if you're interested, you know, talking to them and see if you can shadow, if you can uh, be at their practice for you know, a, a day, a week, or a day, a month, or something like that. I think most people will be pretty receptive of that. Uh, really a profession that um, you know, we, we do care a lot about people <laughs> as well. And I think that would be a, you know, one way to do it, and probably the best way. I think uh, our society in, in general has um, gone perhaps away from sort of like this uh, apprentice kind of uh, learning you know, and, and going into sort of like the academic, very academic kind of, kind of learning. But I think at, at that point, uh, when you're trying to decide what to do with your life, exploring different fields, and in, cause, in the case of veterinary medicine, you know, trying to follow a, a veterinarian might be a, a really a good way to, uh, to get started. Yeah. So I think I remember when I was getting ready to apply for vet school, somebody told me at one point that it was really important to have experience before you get ready to apply because that's definitely something the, the admissions, admissions committee is going to look at. But not just having experience in like a small animal clinic or not just having experience following a bovine veterinarian around. I think if you can sort of get experience sampling different areas of veterinary medicine, it's really important. So when I applied to vet school, I had worked at a small animal emergency clinic. I had followed around bovine veterinarians and I had also uh, worked in veterinary research. So as much diversity as you can get in your experience, I think that will only help you when you're trying to get into vet school. I would agree with everything that's been said. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, I guess this question is open to any of the panelists, and uh, whoever can start, will start. Um, so the question is, um, as you know, vet school is very dependent on uh, GPA requirements, and what advice would you give to students who are struggling in their undergraduate classes? I'll start out with that because I had kind of a sketchy undergraduate GPA. So I graduated from UC Berkeley with a 3.2, which, you know, that's not terrible, but when you look at all the people who are trying to get into veterinary school, which is really competitive, 3.2 is not very, not so good. So, um, if you're struggling with your undergraduate GPA, you have to really supplement your application by looking strong in the other areas. So like we just talked about, that's getting experience in different fields of veterinary medicine. If you can participate in any kind of undergraduate research training program at school, that's also really great. I think that makes your application look very strong. And then just rock it out on the GRE. You guys have to do really well on that. So I ended up taking like a summer long GRE test prep course because I knew with a 3.2 GPA I was gonna have to come in strong on the GRE. So that's kind of what I did because I was in that situation of having a weak undergrad GPA. So I would take a slightly different tack on that. Um, I think all the things to try to get there. But I would tell you that as, as they, how many people went to Sean's opening lecture yesterday, the keynotes? And, and you know, I think they're looking less and less in GPA. Um, so I think being diverse and don't give up if you have a rough start, find ways to correct it. Getting into vet school has become less competitive um, because uh, we have a, a new 
uh, a growth in seats at schools, both in the US and overseas, Caribbean. So right now, by my count, about, it's different than AVMAs, they say about two apply, one gets in. I think 1.4 to 1.5 apply, and one gets in today. Um, but to me, where it's gotten very competitive is in relation to this session, and that is getting into a specialty is becoming more competitive because more people are going for internships and going towards residencies. So I think, as and not always the best advice for becoming the best veterinary, and I think GPA and things like that are becoming more important to veterinary students who want to specialize, whereas my advice always has been study less and go to more rounds and hang out in the clinic more because at least my experience watching students I've trained and people from my class is the top of the class. Some of them were good clinicians, but they weren't the best clinicians. The best clinicians were kind of in the middle, the ones who really wanted to learn what they were learning meant and how to apply it and, and really get their skills down while they were in school and, and, and get the most out of it. So, so I think it's, you know, you just really have to find that balance of where you want to go in your goal and what's going to make you the best you can be. And they're not always the same. Don't neglect your GPA in vet school, though, because I have a, a colleague that uh, is a general practitioner in Northern California that just got uh, basically rejected from a dermatology internship on, on the basis of her GPA because everything else was equal between her and one other candidate. So. Yeah. Definitely, for Don't if you want to go to an internship or residency, your vet school GPA is going to matter. If you want to go into practice, not so much. Yeah, those are those are good comments there. I really don't have much else to add. I, I'm fortunate, I think, that in Brazil, we have a huge number of vet schools, and uh, getting into them is uh, not as really not as hard as it is for you guys in the U.S. So, I mean, if you want to spend uh, five years, five and a half years in Brazil, that you know, may want to apply <laughs> there. Uh, that would be a, perhaps another option. All right, great, thank you. Um, so this next question is directed at uh, Dr. Sakai. So, and I guess going off the last question, what was your least favorite class in your undergraduate year? <laughs> in undergraduate, uh, my least favorite class was Calculus two, and uh, basically I couldn't do it. My, my brain was not a math brain, uh, at least when it comes to that level of math. So. Um, I ended up dropping that class right before the final, and I had to retake it at an easier school over the summer, so. Uh, Dr. Byron? I'm trying to think. <laughs> that shows you why you're giving up a dermatologist versus a cardiologist, because calculus and physics were my favorite class. <laughs> but um, I would say I chose things I liked. I think anything I didn't like, I wouldn't have stayed in past the first week. Yeah, I can't remember which was my least favorite. I mean, there were some that were my favorite, and I remember those, and I, I tried to spend a lot of time on those. I remember I just barely passed on the things that I really didn't care much, um, didn't spend much time uh, on those things. So I think maybe, you know, that's, and I already forgot who, <laughs> what they were. Uh, but I think the point is, you know, you find a, something you really like, a passion, or just really devote time to that. And the rest, you know, if you had to go through it and just be a C there, <laughs> that's okay <laughs> with me. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. So this next question is open to all the panelists. And um, the question is, if you could describe your vet school experience with one word, what would it be? And when you're ready. <laughs> just one? One word? A uh, few words. One Besides word. beer? <laughs> <laughs> That's one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, I think the, the word would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think my word would probably be friendships. Yeah, for me it was fun. <laughs> uh, do you guys want to elaborate more on that? <laughs> <laughs> the friendship or the fun? They could they, they <laughs> <can> mix. <laughs> No, you really, I mean, to me, you, you spend four years, three years really, and then you split up in the fourth year, and some sooner than that now, a lot of schools are going to clinics earlier. Um, you know, you, for, we were 80 in the class. It was when we were kind of shifting the gender shifts that we were 50-50, male, female. 
and you just spend your day walking around with these same people all day. You know, you have your little click. You know, you always know when the freshman class has been in the room because it smells like formaldehyde for days after they sat there because <laughs> they've got it all over them from their anatomy dog or cat or whatever it is. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's just a bond and everybody has rough times. Um, and it's really neat to see how that the classes come together um, and support each other. Yeah, I, I agree with all that stuff. It's really fun and you will make friendships that will last for the rest of your life. It's, it's pretty cool because after you graduate, everyone goes out into different directions across the country, sometimes other countries, different specialties, and so you just have this network that you've made in vet school that will last the rest of your professional and personal life. That's interesting. For me, um, so I grew up on a, on a small farm in Brazil. Uh, it's my dad and my brother. Uh, the three of us worked the, the farm. We didn't have a power or you know, electricity or tractors or anything like that. So we did everything by hand, uh, really. And um, it got pretty hot in the summer, fairly cold in the winter. And uh, we worked really hard. You know, Sunrise, we were already in the fields uh, picking cotton or planting cotton, doing all of that. So it was really hard work. And um, a lot of times at the end of uh, harvesting everything and selling, we had no money. Like, it was really, like, not very fun in that respect. We were lucky if, uh, if we didn't have much debt. So going to vet school, for me personally, was, like, awesome because I didn't have to work with, uh, you know, at 40-degree uh, weather all day long to uh, have no money at the end of six months. Uh, really, like, for me, that was a, a big thing. And I, I can remember many, many times picking cotton super hot, super tired, and my back was about to kill me. And I was like, geez, I can't do this for the rest of my life. This is just too much. And so going to vet school represented to me like sort of like the freedom of uh, getting out of that uh, in one way. And then the other way, obviously, I, I love the, uh, the animals. I love the profession. Um, and so it was, it was really, uh, when I say awesome, it's because you know, it was giving me the freedom to have a choice out of uh, that sort of like the life I had, which it was, it was a good life in many aspects, but I really was not looking forward to you know, having my back about to kill me all day long for the rest of my life. So, and, and, and then you know, on the other hand, be able to still be sort of like present in many ways. Um, you know, we had animals as well growing up and we you know, cared for them, and so in a way, I was not completely going away from what I had. I was just like making it better. So uh, that's how like what vet school really represented for me. Yeah. Thank you. So we're nearing the end of the panel, and I would just like to ask one last question uh, for the panelists. So what kind of general advice, or do you have any words of inspiration for the pre-vet audience today? Um, anyone can start. I think. Uh, like you said, at best, keep an open mind. You know, just really, this is the time to explore. And I know I can remember applying to vet school, and I wasn't one who knew I wanted to be a vet from the time I was young. It kind of came late to me. Um, but when you're kind of applying and it seems that competitive, you're afraid to even think of something else because maybe they can read your mind and they'll know you're not committed. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's important, you know, to show your determination, um, but at the same time, you know, show that you've, you've got breath to you and that you, you know, you have options, whether they're short-term options if you don't get into vet school the first time um, and, or long-term term and that you have an alternative. And I think the same is true in vet school. Don't, don't lock yourself into specializing too early just because you never know who you're going to meet that's really going to really going to inspire you and and you want to follow and that could be a general practitioner and that could be a dermatologist or an anesthesiologist unlikely a cardiologist <laughs> <laughs> so i would just basically tell you guys to really get everything you can and enjoy the time being a student because when i think back you know, I'm, I'm at the beginning of my career, so, you know, I'm, I'm in the early phases, but I still kind of think back sometimes to when I was a student and just think, 
wow, I, w I wish I had known how nice it is to be a student. I mean, you guys basically, your job is to learn right now. Do you know how cool that is? I mean, just really get everything you can out of it because it's not gonna last forever and it's such an awesome time in your life. Yeah, I think I have four words. Work hard, play hard. <laughs> That's all you need to do. Like, really have fun. Like I said before, you know, follow your intuition or your dreams, go explore. And when you go explore, work really hard at it. And then when you're not exploring, you know, play hard, have, have fun. I think life then will be really um, rewarding. You know, and, and that's what I, I still look, look forward to, you know, hopefully I'll have another 100 years to go and I really wanna continue working hard and, and playing hard and exploring different things. So then life will be, to me, really rewarding. All right, thank you. And that concludes. <laughs>So you guys already got the memo. That concludes our specialization <laughs> panel. Uh, uh, can we give another round of applause, please? <laughs>